we wanted to take a quick moment just you know this week was quite a week you know as many of you guys know uh capitol hill um had uh the chop zone or a chaz zone and uh and charlie champ flew in with a team and pastor darren went with them and they uh, saw god move in a lot of ways and so we wanted to play a video to highlight that and then we're going to jump into the message so let's go ahead and roll that an army of Black Lives Matter activists have taken over six city blocks in downtown Seattle. They're surrounding an abandoned police precinct building. They give themselves a name, the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. That's their new country within the borders of our country. They say they will not leave and disband their new nation until the city's police department is abolished completely. because he's anointed me to bring freedom to the captives. If you believe that, clap, shout, wave, throw something at me. Yeah, come on. Charlie, Charlie Sham called me up, and he said, um, bro, things getting crazy over there. I said, yep. He said, um, I'm thinking about getting, uh, getting a plane ticket and get, getting some of my friends and, and come going, into, going into Chaz. And um, I said, all right, awesome. You do that. And, um, and then he's like, you want to come? I said, uh, Absol- Absolutely. Just been waiting for someone to ask. <laughs> you know, you say, "Well, Pastor Darren, didn't 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 Jesus tell you to go?" Nope. Well, no, he didn't. Well, did you have a peace about going? Nope. No, I didn't. You know, well, but you went. Yeah. Well, why'd you go? Because Charlie asked me to go. Right? Like, come on, it's a dangerous place, and I didn't want him to get his butt kicked. Like, if if if, if, if you know, come on, if stuff hit the fan. I'd I'd have to step in and 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 and, and do what I do. You know, people said to me, what are you guys going to do? Let's go to a commercial break. We'll be right back. Water beds. You need one. I'm just kidding. 
Now, if we could actually turn. No. <laughs> It's okay. It's all part of the service. Sometimes in our lives. Thanks. Awesome. Let's start over. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 4. Now, here, here's the thing. Sometimes God calls you to some pretty crazy places, and sometimes you can't necessarily follow the peace, because sometimes the very place that God is calling you, there's no peace there, but the peace is in you, and you got to just bring the peace and release the peace. You say, no, I, can't, I can't go there. Like, there's, there's, there's no peace there. Yeah, but there's peace here. You bring in the peace. You release the you release, you release the peace. We, we went in actually last Sunday night. The guys just landed. And I said, well, you want to go now? They're like, right now? I said, yeah, let's just go. So we went driving in. It's 10 o'clock at night. And they, uh, we found out later that they were watching us because they've got security cameras um, uh, uh, posted up around shop. They were watching us as we came in um, uh, up the street. In fact, they, um, they thought we were the Proud Boys, which is like a, a gang, like kind of a, a white supremacist kind of gang and they were watching us come up and and they said man uh, Vaughn you can turn me down in the monitor a little bit if you want they said man these guys are gonna get their butts kicked right so they're watching us and we're coming up and then um and then we start praying for people and they're like wait a second so anyways um we we started to get a reputation they started calling us like they're like those are the Jesus people you know (laughs) And um, yeah, it's, it's something else. Um, uh, as, as you may have heard, and probably did, um, the very first guy that we prayed for uh, turned out to be the head of CHOP. We got a prophetic word for him, um, and, uh, and, and just saw, uh, it was really cool. So I was giving him this word, and then he goes, he goes um, how do you know this? And I didn't answer his question. I just kept, I just kept talking. And then he just kind of figured it out, and then he goes, Pray for me. And he put out his hands like this. And, and it just began, just began praying for him. And it turns out, you know, he, he was the head of CHOP. One of the, one of the main organizers that met with the, uh, with the mayor of Seattle and went in. And, uh, you know, he got arrested. And um, I guess he has another case, court, a court case coming up um, tomorrow. And so his name's Rio or River. So we'll be praying for him. He's got an awesome call of God on his life. There's an anointing to be like a, uh, like a Paul, like an, like an Apollo, the apostle. He's got an incredible way with words. Um, one guy we... We went out, uh, we were, we were going to get our picture taken by the fist. I don't know if you saw the wood fist that they built out of wood. And a guy came out and said, yep, no, no picture unless you, unless you pay a donation to the movement. And so um, gave him a couple bucks and, and we got our picture taken. Um, and then, uh, and then, and then uh, Alex got a word for him and, and started praying for him. Demons started coming out of him. Um, and, that was, and, then, and, then, and then he just got really touched by the Lord. We came out to the fist the next day. And, uh, and, and, he, and he gave his life to the Lord. He just weeping, weeping, weeping. And he said, um, he said, um, I want, this is, this, is, this is the touching part here. He goes, I want to stop willfully sinning. What's, okay, so what's that called? That, that, that's saying, I want to repent. That's what he was saying. He said, I want to stop willfully sinning. And we said, that's a, that's a noble desire. And, we, and he invited Jesus to come into his life and uh, then saw yesterday um, uh, on, on, on the news, saw him in handcuffs. Uh, he's, a, he's a rapper from, uh, from Portland named Lord Dottie. And they had him in handcuffs and they were, they, were, they were taking him off. So it's pretty crazy to see all these guys getting arrested and, and we know them. Like, we know them. I prayed for him. We prayed, you know. So it's pretty, pretty awesome. And that's what definitely inspired um, this whole thing, freedom for the captives, this whole thing of, of Isaiah 61 and Jesus, where he walks into the temple. So we're going to look at um, uh, verse uh, um, 16. It says that basically Jesus has returned to Galilee at this point. Actually, go to 14. This is really good. Um, 14, it says that Jesus returned to Galilee and the power of the Spirit, and news about him began to spread through the whole countryside. And he was teaching in their synagogues, and everybody praised him. In verse 16, it says that Jesus went to Nazareth, 
as he'd been brought up on the Sabbath day, and he went to the synagogue, and that was his custom, and he stood up to read the scroll of the prophet Isaiah that was handed to him. And unrolling it, he found the place where it's written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Okay, so nothing unusual there. He comes into the synagogue, and he's like, he's got, he's got the scroll. He unrolls the scroll, and he begins reading this prophetic word. This prophetic word that all the Hebrews would have had memorized. Like, yes, this is the, this is another messianic prophecy foretelling our coming Messiah, our coming deliverance. Deliverer. And here is this young Jewish boy, the son of Joseph, okay? He's growing up to be such a fine young man. He'll make, a, he'll make a lovely husband someday. I wonder if he'll take on his father's trade and be a good old carpenter, right? So Jesus reads. Everyone's like, they know who this guy is. Yay. He reads the scroll. Yep. And then he rolls it up, and he gives it back to the attendant, and he sits down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. That means that the eyes of everybody there, they were glued on Jesus, just watching him. And then he says to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And they were all amazed. And gracious words, and the gracious words that came from his lips. And they began saying to each other, isn't that Joseph's boy? Yeah. Yeah. And then he says to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we have heard uh, heard that you did in Capernaum. And truly, I tell you that no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there are many uh, widows in Israel's in Elijah's time. And when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine in the land, and yet Elijah was not sent to any of them but to a widow and there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet and yet none of not one of them was cleansed only Naaman the Syrian and all the people of the synagogue were now furious when they heard this and they got up and they drove him out of town and took him to the brow of a hill which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff But he walked right through the crowd and went his way. Isn't that incredible? This is is what I find fascinating about this this text. Um, That many of us have incredible prophetic words. Many of us have uh, have Bibles. Many of us uh, come to church on Sundays. You know, um, many of us, you know, um, some of us even recycle. Okay? Like, we're, we're not bad people. And yet, a lot of us... We wrestle a little bit with like, what am I doing? Like, what's this, all, what's this all into? And what I love about the ministry of Jesus is that it begins with, it begins with his, um, like his uh, baptism, it begins with his, 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 his ordination into ministry. You say, when did Jesus get ordained into ministry? It's when he got baptized. Remember when Jesus got baptized? A dove comes down. John the Baptist baptized. A dove comes down. And his voice, the voice of his, of his dad comes down. Gives me goosebumps. And he hears his dad say in front of everybody, it's my boy. I'm pleased with him. That was his ordination into ministry. How can that be an ordination in the ministry? It's approval from your father. This is what they're saying. Son, I approve of you. Therefore, you can do everything that I've called you to do. 
And then in that place, when you know your dad approves of you, when you know that, that your dad is, has authorized you, in that place, he goes into the temple. And what does he do? He gets out his cell phone. And he goes to his favorite prophetic word. How many of you got some prophetic words on your cell phone? Just wave them at me. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about right now, like this is a crazy church, you know? Um, sometimes when somebody's going to give you a word, like they're going to pray for you, sometimes we, we just hit the record button because they might say something good and then you can remember it. Well, you know, so Jesus gets out his, old, his favorite prophetic word on his cell phone. What's that? It's the scroll. Isaiah 61. This is what Jesus knew, Okay? That I can't do anything unless it's already been prophesied. I can't do anything unless there's already been a declaration, a word from my Father that has paved the way. And so Jesus takes out the scroll. He, he gives them this incredible prophetic word. And then he said, this is about me. Yeah. Now, if you're wrestling with your role right now, if you're wrestling with your role and you feel like you don't have a scroll, there's like nothing else that you would like more than right now, this year, to be able to say to your friends and your family, I know God's call for my life. I know that he's called me for such a time. If you would like to sit everybody down this Thanksgiving and play a prophetic word and be like, yep, that's about me, 2021 is going to be a little different. I'm going to be doing some crazy stuff right? But you don't feel like you have that. You, we, we have to recognize and realize that even though we say we're, we're sons of God, even though we believe that we are, we are children of God, we have to realize that because of what Jesus has done, follow me here, because of what Jesus has done, we have been invited to participate in that same role of sonship that Jesus was able to participate in. And what does that mean? That in the same way that Jesus found himself in the word, you can find yourself in the word. And when you see prophecies and declarations about a son, about the one who would come, you can find your sonship within his sonship, and you can stand in that word as your very own prophetic word. And for that reason, when I read Isaiah 61, I find myself in that text. Jesus found himself in that text. Jesus said that word is about me. I'm here in Seattle Bible Center. I say Isaiah 61 is about Darren Stott, and I am here. The spirit of the son Sovereign God is upon me because he has anointed me. He has called me. He has ordained me to set captives free. You're going to need a word. In 2020, you're going to need a word lest somebody else's freaky deaky fear-based word becomes your word and keeps you from functioning. If you don't got a word, you will listen to every other word. You'll get lost in the noise of words. We've got to get in the word and find where are you at in the word? Where are you at in the word? And can you read that word and say, yep, that's about me, honey. That's about me. You don't know me. You don't know me. You don't know me like the word know me. Just declare of yourself, I'm a son. I get to participate in my sonship, to the same degree that Jesus participated in your sonship. Now, I need you to see Isaiah 61 is about you. Isaiah 61 is about Seattle Revival Center. And this is what Jesus says. He has anointed me to pro proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners, the recover of sight for the blind, and, and to declare freedom to the oppressed. Now, you'll have to excuse me. Like I've always been kind of a passionate kid. Even before I could preach, I was passionate. Pastor Gail used to let me preach, and I didn't, I didn't have much content, but man, I was passionate. <laughs> you know, I was, thank you, Pastor Gail, for letting me preach. You know, like, I can't imagine what she was thinking. She's like, well, he'll get better. I don't know. Like, you know, oh my gosh, you know, like, so, you talk to some of the old timers around here, they'll tell you, so, there are a few messages that are unforgettable, okay? Um, I've, I've always, you know, I've always loved passionate things. I've always loved passionate music. I've, I've, I've always, you know, favorite movie, Braveheart, you know, uh, you know, before Christ, favorite band, Rage Against the Machine. I, I just, anything just, rah, you know, passion, rah, 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 you know, which is why sometimes church was difficult for me. <laughs> Man, I just wait on the Lord. I was like, wait on the what? 
well, that's, 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 you know. I'm like, where's the electric guitar? Ah, 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 you know? Yeah. All of that is just an ex- all of that is just an explanation. That if I get passionate this morning, I'm not yelling at you. I'm yelling with you. And I don't want anything that I say to be um, shaming or, or condemning because I know the heartbeat of this place. I know the passion of this place. Seattle Revival Center stinking exists because we love people. Why? Because God loves people. I know that we are a people of mission to see people awakened to their identity and destiny in Jesus Christ. I know that Seattle Revival Center exists because of verses like, like Isaiah 61. So today, I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching with you. This is our awakening moment to see what Jesus did in CHOP and to know that there are 10,000 other CHOPs, that there are 10,000 other opportunities, places where there's darkness, places where there's chaos, places where the enemy thinks, ha ha ha, this land is mine. (laughs) Nope. Why? Because we're here. We're on the earth. You're on the earth. Your, 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 your souls are on the soil. And so this morning, this is just a recalibrating moment. I'm not going to tell you anything new unless you're a Satanist and you're here. Welcome. Good to have you. It might be new for you. Awesome. But this is a, this is a morning to recalibrate, to, to get back onto mission a little bit because maybe we've, maybe we've swayed. Maybe we've started hearing the voices out there and we've lost the voice here in, 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 in the word. And so... I want us to remember, this is our Independence Day weekend. This is our Freedom Weekend. We got a declaration, a proclamation of independence for our country. And you've got Isaiah 61, which is a proclamation, a declaration of spiritual freedom. And that is the baseline. That is the standard. You see, you know, even even, even 1776 proclamation of declaration, a lot lot of, um, um, you know, this going on this last week. A lot of this, and like, what is that? Well, you know, like, well, because the Declaration of, of Independence, but it wasn't, it wasn't the, it wasn't for the slaves. They were still, they were still in slavery. That wasn't, that wasn't there. So that's great. All the white people get to be like, we're free, you know. Well, good for you, <laughs> you know. But that wasn't that the moment of, of freedom, you know, for the slaves. And, but there was a slave, and 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 he and he and he ran away from slavery, and 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 he was a believer, and he and he became an incredible voice within the civil rights movement. And, and, uh, and uh, Frederick Douglass, and, 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 and he speaks of the Declaration of Independence as, as, as he didn't poo-poo it, and he didn't say, well, that's just a, that's just a Declaration of Independence for white. No, he says, that is, a dec- that is the ideal, that is the standard, and until that is the standard for every single human being in our country, then we are not where God wants us to be. Now, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. The Declaration of Independence, we are now in this place where, where blacks and whites get to celebrate Jesus and that our country is free, and that we didn't have to be afraid to come to church today, okay? Yeah. For the, okay. For the most part, for the most part, we didn't have to be afraid to come to church t- t- today, but, but this, is, this is what I'm saying, that there are still many people in our country that are not spiritually free, and they are just as much a slave to sin and generational oppression, that they are just as, that they are just as blind in, 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 these, in these kinds of places, and, and, and we can't say that we can't celebrate freedom in Christ because there are so many people that are still in slavery. This is what we have to say. Isaiah 61 is our proclamation of freedom freedom. This is the baseline. This is the standard. And we should not be content within the church until every man and woman and boy and girl within our country can step into a place of life and life abundantly. We can't just say that, that we are saved, we are, we, have, we are the elect ones, and, that, and we're happy, and, and so let's just defend our freedom, and let's just, you know, you know, do whatever it takes, you know, outside of losing our salvation to make sure that Trump gets four more years, and that'll just take care of everything. No, it stinking won't. Trump is not the hope of glory for this world. No, Jesus Christ is the hope of glory, and he's inside of stinking you. He's inside of me, that we are invited into this mission 
mission of liberation into this into this message of the glorious gospel. And so just to, we've, we've got to be a people of mission. Lest we think Christianity is just some sort of moralistic deism where we try to be good little people so we can make it to heaven. You know what I'm saying? You know, we try to attend church. We try to do this and that. You know, it just, just hopefully we don't end up in hell. <laughs> Know that we are called to partner in our sonship. We are called to join the mission of Jesus. And Jesus wasn't just, Jesus, we, we put so much hippie crap on Jesus. We do. Like, Jesus, he wasn't a human doing. It was a human being. And he, Jesus just, like, did nothing. He just, like, he, he listened to soaking music and combed his hair all day. You know, Jesus was a hard stinking worker. He was raised as a carpenter. Every single, like, b- dude basically homeless, going from town to town. The dude worked hard. The guy, you know, got tired, and he was a man on a stinking mission. He was a man with an agenda. It's time for the church to wake stinking up and to be a people with an agenda. I feel like you showed up with an agenda. Uh-huh. Yeah, here's the thing. Like, we didn't have a plan when we went down to Chubb, but we had an agenda. We didn't go down there to affirm them. We weren't here, oh, this is so, look what you've done. Look at this. It's, it, there's nothing, there was nothing, there was no glory there. It was, I got to have a, a, multiple conversations with the leader of CHOP, and, and, and we were having a conversation, just him and I, just him and I, and then all of a sudden it starts to get heated and a crowd starts to gather, which is not a good thing. And he began, and, and, and he's just, and he's talking to me, and then finally I, I stopped him and I said, this isn't good. I said, I think you guys think you've established some sort of shadow, go- like some sort of like grassroots government. And this idea that that we're able to police ourselves. I said, bro, I was here last night. Our group was threatened last night. Our our group was told that if we come back here, that that you guys would kill us because we look like cops. I I don't, that's not utopia. Like, Like, I would not bring my wife down here. I would not bring my children down here. Like, it did not, I told him this. He, and I said, this is not going to end well. He goes, bro, you sound just like that reporter that I talked to this morning. You're using the same exact words. I was like, bro, I hope you're listening. And he goes, I, I, I got to go do something. And then he walked off. That this, is, this is what we, my point is this, that when we do something, we do it intentionally. We do it missionally. That we've got a mission within us. And this is what Jesus says. He opens the scroll and he's like, I've been anointed. I've been appointed. I'm here on earth with an agenda that we find within the prophetic documents for our life, what is that agenda? If you don't have an agenda, you got one today. If you don't have a call, you got one today. You are called, anointed, appointed for such a time as this. The, the, hey, <laughs> the good news is your identity is ranking up a few points. The bad news is next year is going to be a lot of work for you. All right. This is what Jesus says in John 3, 16. For God, say with me, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. Jesus is like, that's why I'm here. We see in Luke 19, verse 10, Jesus says to himself, for I came to seek and save the lost. You're going to hear some words um, this morning about prisoners, about the brokenhearted, about the blind, about the lost. She's like, that's why, that's why I'm here. We see in Matthew chapter 28, it's like the end of his earthly ministry, and Jesus is like, um, hey, now it's your turn to run. Go ye into all the world and make disciples of nations. Freedom is our mission. Liberty is our mission. Reconciliation is our mission. I, I was talking with this guy um, downtown. His name, his name was Blake. And um, he was screaming at our very own David Kusick. Now, I don't know if you guys know David or not. He's just not the guy you would ever scream at. He's just the most quietest, chill guy. The reason why he was screaming at David is because David said something so controversial. He said, is there any way I can pray for you? 
When he said that, he set the guy off. The guy said, how dare you? You are a Christian and you're here on Capitol Hill. And you don't support the GLBTQ. You don't support who I am. How dare you? He's going, he's going off on, on David. Finally, I, I come walking up. And I'll, I'll be honest, I was a little, I was a little angry. Because this guy's going off on David. And David's just like, David's just absorbing it, which is so awesome. David's stinking, um, Kusick, that kid. I can just talk about him because he's not here. But I go walking up, and then all of a sudden, the yelling transferred over to me, and then I got to absorb some stuff. <laughs> you know, I'm absorbing it. And finally, he, he asked me a very interesting question, and, 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 and I'm not going to get into it um, uh, right here, um, but he got into this thing of, of what do I have to do to atone for all the, all the stuff I've done sexually that's not in your Bible. He's some pretty strong, strong words. What do I have to do to atone for? I said, bro, you don't get it. You're already loved. He forgave you 2,000 years ago that on the cross, he became all of your sexual sin, whether you're not... Whether you're willing to admit it or not, he took on all of your sexual sin. He took on all of your unrighteousness. He took it on the cross so that you could be righteous. 2,000 years ago, it's done. You can't save yourself. There's nothing you can do to atone for yourself. Like, he's done it, and all you have to do is believe and receive. You want to know what this guy said to me? He said, what kind of freak, non-denominational thing are you a part of? This is not what Christians believe. He had never, you guys, he, he had never heard the gospel because he thought that the gospel was basically Republicans who hate gays. Some sort of white bread kind of thing. And, 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 and guess what? I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't share this on the, on the, on the video. But the, the guy let me pray for him. But his, his whole thing was, if you want to pray for me, you're going to have to stand on the rainbow. I said, bro, I love rainbows. <laughs> just to clear, I'm on mission I have an agenda in my mission freedom is my mission the next thing Jesus says is that I'm here because I'm called to be here God has anointed me. I want you to participate right now with this revelation that God has already anointed you for this year, for 2020. God has already anointed you for what he has called you. You don't need me to lay hands on you. You don't need me to pour oil on you. You have already been anointed. Jesus says, I am anointed for such a time as this. My identity, it's determined by my revelation of me. My reality comes from the the anointing on me, the good things that I've done, the bad things that I've done, they do not qualify me or disqualify me. I am qualified because of the blood of the lamb. I am qualified because of the cross that I am who he says that I am. I'm not what I'm even capable of doing. I am his accomplishments. I am his report card. And in this place, we realize that freedom is our appointment, and that's why the enemy's been coming to disappoint you so much. What's he trying to do? He's trying to rob you of your appointment. And this is what Jesus says. I have been appointed and anointed. Some of you, you need to say this over yourself, because you've been saying the opposite for a long time. You've been saying things like, I'm not ready yet, or I'm, I'm not anointed enough yet, or I'm not like, I don't know the Bible like I should. That's why there's Google. Like, like, like you know, I, I, but this is the truth. You are qualified. You are anointed. So don't let the enemy steal your appointment with what? Disappointment. That's why that thing that happened back in 1987 still crushes you so much. Why? It was so disappointing. What happened? You were robbed of an appointment. And this is what the Lord wants, wants you to know. It's a good thing that thing didn't happen in 1987. He is a good and faithful shepherd. Don't let the enemy rob you of your 2020 appointment because of your disappointment in 1987 or your disappointment in 2019. Come on now. 
or maybe even your disappointment here within the first two quarters of 2020, just say, this is between you and the Lord, but just, just say, I will not be robbed of my appointment. Freedom is my appointment. Paul would say in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and don't go back to the yoke of slavery. It's important that in all of this we remember that our freedom does not exist to inflate our own internal American narcissism. A lot of times we think that you know, as Americans, freedom just becomes just another song. Let freedom ring. Let it ring like a bell. And bald eagles too. Bald eagles find ringing freedom and stuff. And I'm proud of it. Freedoms for captives. Jesus said, I'm here for the poor. I'm here for prisoners. I'm here for the blind. I'm here for captives. And what I'm so thankful for, for the invitation this last week to go into this area, is I got to see the poor, those with limited resources, those with limited opportunities, those with limited influence. And I got to declare over them who they are in Jesus. We must not neglect the poor. The poor are radically close to the heart of God. When you read the first century church, we see it was, it, was the, it was the role of the church to take care of the poor, not the role of the government. Jesus says, I'm here for prisoners, those who have no rights, those who are living underneath the shame of punishment because of something that, they, that they've done. Jesus is like, I'm here for them. I'm here for the bad dudes. I'm here for the disgraceful ones. Jesus is like, I'm here for the blind. Those who have been robbed of the data that they need to thrive and flourish on the earth. This is why I'm here, to open their eyes so that they can see. So that they can see me and they can see who they are in me. Jesus says, I'm here for the captives. Those who have been taken from their homes, those who have been taken from their heritage, those who have forgotten where they've even come from, I'm here for the captives. When we don't have interaction, when we don't have heart, when we don't have ministry, when we don't have love for the poor, the prisoner, the blind, and the captives, then we can have the right beliefs, but look nothing like Jesus, look nothing like the early church, and just become this some sort of American Western framework for good spirituality with Jesus somewhere in the middle of it. But this is what I hear the Lord saying. There is opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. And if we will say yes with his yes, he will back you up. He will back you up. If you allow your yes to come in with his yes, and you don't have to look like me. In fact, please don't. One Darren is plenty for the earth. And you, and you might not need this stage. In fact, I, I would bet that your stage that you have right now is, is way more important than this stage right here. That if the Holy Spirit can use me to inspire and pour just a little bit of fuel on the fire within your heart, that's, that would come to shake off any sort of like narrative as far as what a good little Christian looks like and says, says, hey, this is not the year to be a Christian. This is the year to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. That, then he walked on water and he healed blind eyes and he said to Lazarus, this is the Jesus that went to a funeral where everybody was crying and they, and, and they, were, and they were judging Jesus because he didn't show up on time and, and he could have done something and now he's dead. And he's been dead. Wait, Jesus, he could have done something. And, and Jesus engages and he enters into, he enters into the sorrow. He, he, he doesn't say, don't you know who I am? I'm, I'm the son of God and I'm not going to enter. And I, like, like deal, with, deal with your emotional immaturity shortest verse in the Bible says and Jesus wept how long has it been since the church has wept with the things that are so many times that we, we can't enter into weeping 
We, we find ourselves judging the very ones that are weeping because they, because they should just get over it. They, they should just, and we find ourselves making these blanket statements to keep us safe so that we don't have to enter into the injustice, so that we don't have to go to the funeral. So it says, and Jesus wept, and then he wipes the tears away, and it says that Jesus approached the tomb. And, and, the, and, the, and, and the, the Greek words that it uses to describe Jesus approaching the tomb, it, it says and he approaches the tomb with anger. And, and, and it's almost like the, 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 there's pictures that can describe it. And the way that I heard it taught is, is, is the way that it describes the anger of Jesus approaching the tomb is like a, is like a bull with its nose flaring, flaring and just, just grunting with, with just such violent rage at death, at the injustice of death. And Jesus approaches the tomb and says, Lazarus, come forth. And there, the guy that's been dead for days comes up and walks out of the tomb and everybody starts to freak out. Why? Because Jesus shows that he has authority over death. And when I read that, where do I find me in that picture? Am I the dead guy in the tomb or am I the guy that gets to approach the tomb and say, Laz, where are you at in that story? Who are you going to be in that story? Are you going to be the one judging Jesus or are you going to be the one approaching the tomb saying, I found myself in the word. I found myself in the story. And Jesus said this, greater things than these will you do in my name. It's about liberty. It's about freedom. It's not just about liberty to, to meet our, 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 to meet and feed our American excesses so we can have more and feed our own souls with more and that whole kind of gluttonous thing. We've got to repent of our freedom gluttony because in the church, we just want more freedom, more freedom, more freedom. And we're freedom fat. But we're not around the poor. And we're not around prisoners. And we're not around blind. And we're not around the captives. And Charlie said to me, I'm watching New York. I'm like, why? He's like, I want to get back in it. And I'm telling you, there's a time that's coming when, the church, when, when, when chaos begins to erupt. The church is going to say, yes, it's time for us to arise and shine because God has called me. He has anointed me. The spirit of the sovereign God is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news, good news, good news. And when he was born, the angel said, good news of great joy that will be for all people. For all people. For unto you was born this day in the city of David. Savior, which is Christ the Lord. What is it there? What is, it's, it's a moment for us to, re, to recalibrate. It's a moment for us to realize that we've got to spend our energy. We've got to spend our Facebook energy. We've got to spend our, 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 our TV energy. We've got, to, we've got to take all this energy and we've got to figure out how do we use our vitality? How do we do, use our time? How do we use all of this to get this great and glorious gospel message out, which is good news. Listen, we wrestle not against Democrats, but against spiritual powers and creepy cosmic things. Don't use your energy fighting the wrong enemy. Use your voice. Use your talents. Use your abilities to declare Jesus is alive and he loves this world and he loves this nation and I've been called. I am appointed. I feel the fire of God. Well, Bradley, why are you going there? You can't go there. What are you doing? You can't do that. You're not qualified. You don't have the ministry credentials. What did, you, did God call you? Nope. Well, then, did you have a dream? Nope. Then what's going on? My heart's breaking, and I have the Prince of Peace inside of me, so I have to release this peace that people would say to you, well, what's your revelation? I don't, the revelation is Christ Jesus. That's all I need. Listen. You don't need more of heaven. Christ Jesus is heaven, and he's been seated inside. You don't need another prophetic conference. You've got the word of God. You've got the Bible. Take it. Eat it. Eat this revelation, and let it inspire a new passion. And ask Jesus, what's robbing me of my passion? What's making me complacent? What's making me predictable? What's making me boring? I want to make the 13-year-olds, like, I want to wear them out. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I want to make the, the young people, no, I can't hang with Pastor Dan. What, that, that guy, like, like he's crazy. He's crazy. I hope I've got, I hope I've got just a little, you know, have you ever seen somebody that's, crazy and they've got that look in their eye where you're just like this guy's capable of doing doing some stuff this guy's capable I hope I got a little bit of that crazy in my eye 
And I hope that no matter how old I get, I never lose that craziness. You, you hang out with Pastor Gail, she's got that look. You hang out with Pastor Gail, she's just like, you'll just start dreaming. You'll just start talking about, so I think I'm going to buy that business. You're going to buy what? You start hanging out, Pat, well, she's got that, that look, that little bit of, we could, we could, we could take them. We could take that land. But there's giants, giants. <laughs> My favorite story by far in the Bible is the shepherd boy that honors the king by asking his permission to kill a giant that none of the adults, that none of the soldiers would kill. And the king's like, you're just a boy, you're going to get killed. But he honored that boy's courage enough to let him go and try. And that day, David killed a giant. And they took out all of the enemies. This has been a long-term standoff that had been going on for such a long time. And everybody was so afraid. Nobody wanted to do anything. It was a shepherd boy. It was a stinking shepherd. You track it like somebody that watches sheep for a living. That was just like, this is wrong. And I'm angry. And if none of you guys will do anything about it, I'm going to do something. The shepherd boy goes, he honors the king, and he asks for permission. I'd like to go and kill that uncircumcised Philistine. This boy, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe Abigail's age, maybe 12. I, I see him as scrawny and skinny. He didn't only kill the giant. He took the, Goliath's own sword. They chopped that head off of the giant. And they picked the giant's head up. And they had a parade back to town with the head of Goliath. You gotta be a little crazy to do that. Some of you need to get your crazy back. Right, Melanie? Melanie is down there. She was down there right in the height of it. Her, Abby, and Elizabeth Cooper went in, went into the park with their guitars, just started making proclamations and declarations, just started singing. And guess what? Everyone, they left them alone. They just left them, they let them do their thing. Declarations that were going up into, we've got to get our crazy back. Let's stand. Feel that? You feel that shift, that recalibration, just that. Just go and hold out your hands. Father, I pray for fresh oil, fresh courage, and the restoration of appointments. That no disappointment from your past would rob you of the courage that you need to be obedient today. Father, I thank you that this is a house of David's. Lord, I thank you for the 10,000 chops in 10,000 places, from government to education to the family sphere to the sciences sphere, from media to entertainment, 10,000 chops, 10,000 realms where there's not government, 10,000 realms where there's not the voice of the Lord speak, 10,000 places, 10,000 opportunities in the church of Jesus Christ that says, why not today, why not now, why not me? Isn't someone going to do something? Father, I thank you for the Davids that are in this house. They are Davids of honor. They are Davids that go before unbelieving kings to get permission. That we're not looking for shortcuts. We're not looking to break laws. We're looking to do things right. We're looking to do things unto righteousness. We're looking to glorify God with the power of God. Lord, I thank you for the governors that are in this room. I thank you for the legislators that are in this room. I thank you for the order and the function of Melchizedek, a, a company of priests and kings that are walking in authority, but they're also intercessors, and they also have hearts that break. Lord, I thank you, Father, Lord, that you're calling us not just to keep the peace. Lord, you're calling in us into this righteous place of making war, Lord, so that darkness can be subverted and peace can endure for generations. I bless, Lord, your people here today, and I declare the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Thank you, Lord, that you're leading us and you're guiding us. Lord, even, even through valleys of shadow of death, Lord, that we will fear no evil. And in 2020, we declare we will fear no evil. 
because I know where you be. You be with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I declare shalom over you. I declare shalom over your business. I declare shalom over your marriage. I declare shalom over the, the affairs that you're attempting to manage in this time. Grace and peace be unto you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ.